Hello and welcome to Topic 5, Lecture 1. And in this lecture, we're going to talk about civil rights, equality, and the United States Constitution. So what are we going to cover in this lecture? Well, first, we're going to revisit some key concepts that we talked about in earlier in this semester. And then we're going to talk about the Constitution and where we find equal protection of the laws. And then we're going to talk about the different levels of scrutiny that the Supreme Court uses in civil rights cases. So let's go ahead and get started. So last week you read chapter four, which focused on civil liberties, that is the individual rights and personal freedoms with which government are constrained from interfering. And this week we are turning our sights to civil rights, chapter five. Um, and so as we know that civil rights are an obligation that we place on government. Civil liberties are telling government what it can't do. Civil rights is telling government what it must do. And what it must do is that it must guarantee equal treatment of people and to protect citizens from discrimination. So your textbook has a great quote that it, you know starts chapter five, and it, it basically says that in the United States, the history of slavery and legalized racial discrimination against African Americans and gender discrimination against women coexist uneasily with a strong tradition of individual liberties. And so, you know, here, you know, we're doing civil rights second, civil liberties first, because civil liberties is really about that strong tradition of individual liberty, that people have these rights to worship, to pursue freedom, to express themselves, right? Um, and, and so, you know, a big part of our political culture is civil liberties. A big part of our political culture is also equality, that as it says there, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal and they're endowed with their creator with certain unalienable rights, okay? And so on the one hand, we have the strong tradition embedded in our founding documents, in our political culture regarding liberty and equality. But when you actually look at the amount of discrimination and discriminatory treatment that has taken place in the United States, that it, it, it's almost you know an understatement to say that uh, this discrimination has coexisted uneasily with a strong tradition of individual liberty. And so as we, you know, started at the very beginning of the semester, you know, we've said that that we do have these values that undergird our political culture, but the United States hasn't always lived up to the ideals of liberty and equality. And remember earlier in the semester, we talked about Martin Luther King Jr.'s I Have a Dream speech, where he basically talks about the United States has this promise that all men, all people, whether they're white, black, male, female, that they have these liberties and these equalities. But as he says in his I Dream, I, uh, I Have a Dream speech, you know that basically that this is a promise that's been made to people, but that the US is defaulting on this promissory note of equality. And so American history can really be viewed as a fight to make good on this promise of equality. And this week we're gonna be examining the fight for that equality fight for the equal protection of the law in race, gender, sexual orientation, ethnicity, age, body ability, ability, et cetera. Now in lectures, we're gonna focus primarily on racial and gender um, equality, but uh, the, the, this is a long chapter this week and I will depend on you to make sure that you read all of the other fights for equality that have gone on in the United States. Now, even though equality is a key value of American political, political culture, it, it wasn't a part of the United States Constitution in, until after the Civil War. And so until the Civil War amendments are added to the Constitution, which we'll talk about in a moment, the word equality was not in the Constitution. The concept of equality was not in the Constitution. And so after the war, there was concern that as former Confederate states rejoined the Union, that that because this explicit statement of equality under the law is not in the Constitution, there was a really big concern that those former Confederate states would deny the rights of African Americans and others. And that denial of rights would continue even though the Confederate states had lost the Civil War. And so in order to make sure that we, equality was embedded in the Constitution, the Constitution needed to be amended. 
Following the Civil War, there were three amendments that were added to the United States Constitution in order to explicitly articulate um, the United States commitment to uh, equality. And so let's put all the three uh, Civil War amendments up here and we'll talk about each of these individually. So the, the Civil War amendments are the 13th Amendment, the 14th Amendment, and the 15th Amendment. The 13th Amendment was the first amendment that was added after the Civil War, right at the end of the Civil War of 1865. It was one of the first acts of the post-Civil War Congress. Uh, and it is the amendment that abolishes slavery. And if you haven't seen the movie Lincoln, directed by Steven Spielberg, I really encourage you to watch it because it is a great depiction of the struggle, and the difficult struggle to pass the 13th Amendment through Congress. The 13th Amendment abolishes slavery. And you might think, well, why do you have to have the 13th Amendment in the Constitution? Because didn't the Civil War abolish slavery? What about the Emancipation Proclamation that ended slavery? Well, the Emancipation Proclamation applied to the Confederate states, those who had left the Union. So it wasn't a universal um, uh, abolition of slavery. And so as um, former Confederate states joined back into the Union, they wanted to have absolute legal foundation for the ending of slavery. And that's what the 13th Amendment does. The 14th Amendment has several provisions and uh, including the Equal Protection Clause. We're gonna actually look at that on the next slide since there are se several sections I wanna dig into. And then the 15th Amendment, 1870, uh, was, uh, it has to do with voting rights, okay? And so the 15th Amendment forbids denying rights to vote based on race or previous condition of servitude. And so it basically gives African-American men the constitutional right to vote. But as you'll learn in the textbook, it's really not until the passage of the Voting Rights Act in, 18, in 1965 that actually like brings into force the 15th Amendment right to vote for African-American men, okay? So these are the important amendments that are added that begin the pathway to realizing racial equality in the United States. So the 14th Amendment added to the Constitution in 1868 is an incredibly important amendment. It does many things, and let me highlight a few of them. One thing that the 14th Amendment does is that it, it grants birthright citizenship basically says that anybody who was born in the United States is a citizen of the United States. And at the time of the 1868, that, you know, slavery, the, the, the um, system of slavery, chattel slavery, you know, started in the United States very early on uh, in, you know, at the, at, the, at the colonial era in 1619. And so by the time of 1868, um, that the people were who were held in slavery that had all been born in the United States, okay? And so that that there wanted to be a clear understanding that anybody was born in the United States, including slaves and former slaves, were citizens of the United States. That was very important because in the Dred Scott decision, the Dred Scott decision said that slaves could never be citizens of the United States, that slavery in and of itself like basically voided your ability to become a, a citizen. And so the 14th Amendment, again, answers that question, embeds it in the highest law of the land, saying, if you're born here, you are a citizen. And then there are three clauses that I'll put up here and uh, which are also important to the pursuit of equality. It's the Privileges and Immunities Clause, the Due Process Clause, and the Equal Protection Clause. Um, that in the body of the United States Constitution, um, that the Constitution, and we know this when we learned about the nationalization of the Bill of Rights, in that, it, you know, there was a question, hey, does the Bill of Rights apply to the states or just to the actions of the federal government? And it wasn't until the passage of the 14th Amendment and the Equal and the Due Process Clause that basically the Bill of Rights applies to the states. Because as you see there, the Due Process Clause says that states can't take away your life, liberty, or property without the due process of law. And, this, and the Bill of Rights is all about liberty, right? And so the 14th Amendment is telling specifically the states that they can't do things. And that was essentially important after the Civil War because you're, you know, bringing 
former Confederate states back into the Union, and we have to have a clear message to those states and to all states that they can't engage in certain discriminatory actions. And so the Privileges and Immunity Clause says that um, states can't uh, make or enforce any law which takes away the privileges and immunities of being a citizen of the United States. Again, saying that citizens have these particular rights, states can't take them away. States can't take away people's citizens uh, or any person's life, liberty, or property. And the Equal Protection Clause that says that no, nor shall any state deny any person within its jurisdiction the equal protection of the law. And it's with that clause that we have the absolute specific articulation of equality, that states cannot take away um, equal protection of the law to the people that live in their jurisdiction. So what is the equal protection of law? What does that phrase mean? Well, let's ask Cornell Law School's Legal Information Institute uh, and, and look at what their definition of the equal protection of law is. Uh, according to Cornell, uh, that it states that the equal protection forces the government to govern impartially, to not draw distinctions between individuals solely on differences that are irrelevant to a legitimate government objective. Okay. And so what does that mean? Let's use some examples to bring that to life. Um, so let's say that the government is drawing distinctions between voters. And one of the um, distinctions that they draw is based on race or gender. And another distinction that they draw is based on age, okay? And so uh, that let's say you have laws in the book that say that you uh, that deny black people the right to vote or deny women the right to vote. When we look at the equal protection of law and that clause in the 14th Amendment, we'd have to ask ourselves, is race and um, sex, is that relevant to a, a legitimate government objective? In this case, is it relevant to the qualities and the qualifications of being a voter? Well, since race and gender don't have absolutely anything to do with any characteristics of being a human. It just determines either the color of your skin or your sex parts, right? That it's, you know, I feel pretty confident to say that drawing those distinctions and those differences can, does not seem to be related to a legitimate government objective, um, that these are irrelevant to the legitimate government objective of determining criteria for voters. But on the flip side of that, you could say, well, how about if you deny people under the age of 18 the right to vote? What if you say that you must be 18 years or older to vote? Well, one could argue that, I mean, that a person's age is related to a legitimate government objective, right? I mean, particularly th three-year-olds, four-year-olds probably do not have the capacity to make a decision about who they want to you know, elect to office. So it might make sense to say that that is not an irrelevant distinction, that that's quite relevant to a government objection, objective. On the flip side of that, you could say, well, what about a 15 or a 16 year old, right? 15 and 16 year olds who commit crimes are, are presumed to have the capacity to understand what they're doing. Well, uh, is it fair to deny uh, 16 year olds the right to vote? Well, I think an argument could be made that that is perhaps an irrelevant, uh, you know, that age of 16 is perhaps irrelevant to a government objective. However, 16 year olds are still cooking up in terms of their reasoning and their impulse controls, et cetera. Their brain's still developing. And so again, that is the kind of question that we might ask if we were on the court about what, about, you know, e the equal protection of law. And are these differences legitimate or are they illegitimate, illegitimate and irrelevant to a legitimate government objective? So when we talk about the equal protection of law, we're, we're talking about that the equal protection of law prohibits treating people differently without justification, okay? And so there are times when treating people differently is absolutely justified, and there are times when it's not justified at all. So how do we determine, how do we know whether a different treatment is justified and therefore constitutional? Uh, 
How do we know that? Who or what decides that? Who answers the question as to whether different treatment is constitutional? Well, it's the Supreme Court of the United States that decides whether or not the Equal Protection Clause has been violated. And that picture there is like lo looking into the magistry of the Supreme Court. It is quite ornate, <laughs> you know, as are many of our government buildings. And so put another way that it's the, the Supreme Court who is the one who looks at laws that differentiate between people based on categories of race or gender or um, you know, physical ability or age uh, and ethnicity. And they ask the question, does that violate the Equal Protection Clause? Is there a reason, a justification for that different treatment, or is there no justification for that different treatment? And so the Supreme Court answers that question, and the way that, that they have answered that question has changed over time, right? Case in point, in um, 1898, the Supreme Court, when faced with laws in Louisiana that treat people differently uh, on train cars, right? That there's a train car for white people and a train car for black people. The Supreme Court said that that different treatment was justified, that um, separate it, but equal, as long as there are train cars that people can ride upon, then the Equal Protection Clause has not been violated. Well, uh, about 50, 60 years ago in Brown versus the Board of Education, the Supreme Court revisits that in terms of school segregation. And they say that separate, even if it's the same and equal, is not, cannot be equal if it's based on racial uh, segregation. And that basically segregated schools violate the Equal Protection Clause. So it's the Supreme Court that decides that. And it's also the Supreme Court changes its understanding of and its interpretation of the Equal Protection Clause over time. Over time. Um, the Congress and the executive branch also play a role in equal protection of the law because the court may determine whether or not a law is unconstitutional, right? Such as separate, um, you know, uh, separate schools uh, based on race. But it's the Congress in passing federal law and the executive branch in passing executive or orders that can basically embed into federal law um, the civil rights, the guarantee of civil rights, okay? So it's the combination of federal law and Supreme Court's de decisions that provide that equal protection of the law. So turning our sights back to the Supreme Court, um, that the Supreme Court is the one who determines whether or not laws violate the Equal Protection Clause. And they don't do that blindly or randomly. The Supreme Court uses tests or standards so that when a case comes to the Supreme Court and the question before the court is, does this law that treats different categories of people differently, is that law a constitutional or does it violate the Equal Protection Clause? The Supreme Court uses determined tests when uh, adjudicating, when evaluating those laws, okay? So as it says there, the court uses different standards or tests to determine whether different treatment is permissible or not, thus determining the constitutionality of law. And as we're going to see in a moment, as we look through the tests that the court uses, the higher the test or the higher the level of scrutiny, the harder it is to justify different treatment. In other words, the harder it is to say that this different treatment is constitutional. The, the first test that the Supreme Court uses is known as the rational basis test. And this is the lowest level of scrutiny that's used by the court, okay? In other words, that, um, that when the, a, a case comes to the Supreme Court and they use the rational basis test, that it's pretty easy for the court to find that law constitutional. And, I'll, and we'll talk about why that is in a moment. Um, so when the, the court uses the rational basis test, the burden is placed on the individual to prove that there's no reason for the different treatment, okay? And so that if you're being, if, if there's a law that is treating you differently than other people, okay, then the person who's harmed by that law has to make a case, they have to prove that there's no reasonable, there's no rational basis for that different treatment. So the burden of proof is placed on the individual, not the government. 
Um, they have to demonstrate that there's no rational basis for the law. And when this test is used, it's really difficult to show that the law that is unjustified. In other words, when you use this low level to saying, hey, is, is there a reason for this different treatment? Um, usually that law is going to be deemed constitutional. Let me give you some concrete examples today. Uh, today, it's mostly used for regulatory purposes. And so that, uh, that you need a license for driving a car, you need a license for certain kinds of jobs, being a beautician, being a doctor, a lawyer, et cetera, right? You need to be licensed to practice. And you, that, that your different treatment, right? That there are certain qualities that you need, age, being able to see, to drive a car. And it seems pretty reasonable or rational to say that if you can't see or you're four, that you can't get a, um, you know, a license to drive a car. Also that you can't practice medicine if you don't know medicine, right? Seems pretty reasonable. And the burden would be put on the person who wants to practice law without a law degree to prove that that law, that de demanding that you have a license is irrational, dip difficult to do. Uh, age, uh, uh, saying that there's a minimum age to buy a gun or to buy cigarettes or a specific minimum income uh, that one has to have in order to get uh, benefits, right? Uh, and so, uh, it, for example, uh, the, the, saying that the law says that you must be under a certain level of income in order to get food stamps, that makes sense because food stamps help poor people, not you know people of moderate and high income. Uh, a, a max, a minimum age to get you know Medicare, right? Sixty five makes sense. Sixty five, you're going to have more diseases, okay? Uh, and it used to be used for gender, but not anymore. We use a higher level of scrutiny for gender. So uh, until the 1950s, it was really easy for um, states to pass laws that basically said, hey, women can't be bartenders or women can't work in bars or women can't be elevator operators, right? Or women can't work more than eight hours a day. Uh, that the woman had to show that there was not, nothing rational about that law, it's pretty, pretty easy to come up with a reason, right? Bars are dangerous. Women need protection, right? Elevator cars, uh, cars you're, a man walks into an elevator and there's a, an elevator operator for a woman and her safety is going to be in jeopardy, right? So it used to be a lot easier to have these sort of different treatment laws between men and women, right? Uh, because the rational basis test was used. It's not used anymore today. The second test that the court uses is the, uh, is the second level. Uh, it's known as the intermediate scrutiny test. Uh, and in this test, more burden is placed on the government when this test is used. On the previous test, all the government, that, that the government didn't have to show anything. The burden of proof was on the individual to say that there was no rational reason for this law. If the uh, intermediate scrutiny test is used, the government must show that yes, this law is rational, but rationality, ra a reason for the law is not enough, but that you, the government also must show that the law serves an important governmental interest, okay? And so it makes it a, a more pressure on the government that when there are laws that are uh, distinguishing between people that you have to, the, the government has to prove that that different treatment is related to an important interest. Uh, the, the intermediate uh, scrutiny test is the test level that's used on laws that differentiate on the basis of gender and on sexual orientation, okay? Uh, the highest level of scrutiny, the strict, strict scrutiny test is the one that's used on race. And we're gonna look at that on the next slide. Uh, and so here are some uh, uh, cases that used the intermediate scrutiny test or issues. Uh, there was a case that came to the, the Supreme Court about the Virginia Military Institute. The Virginia Military Institute was a military institute that was um, for men only. Women would apply to go to this, um, this institution and they would be denied admissions based on the based on their gender and their gender alone. And so the court using the intermediate scrutiny set test said that, that that there was um, there was uh, dividing, not allowing women to go to the um, Virginia Military Institute was not related to an important government interest. And in fact, they kind of questioned whether the law was rational at all because women were just as capable of being um, in the military as men. 
there were laws regarding different ages for purchasing beer. And so that there were laws in the books that said that you had could be 18 to purchase beer if you're a woman, but 21 years to purchase um, uh, uh, a beer if you were a guy. And uh, using the intermediate scrutiny test, they said that um, having those different ages was not related to an important interest of the state. Didn't make sense. The, the roads weren't safer if guys had to wait till 21 to drink beer. Uh, and it's also, you know, prohibiting gay and lesbian folks from getting married um, that the intermediate scrutiny test was there. And the, basically the court said that, that not letting gay and lesbian folks get married, that's not related to an important um, uh, interest of the government. So it's more difficult to discriminate if this test is used, but it's it's not impossible. Uh, right now, only men need to apply for the selective service. Um, it's possible that you could say that, you know, going to the Virginia Military Institute as a school, right, doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to be fighting in a war. It means that you're going to learn to fight in a war. Uh, the selective service is for having a draft so that we can pull upon folks in case there we need to um, people the military in order to fight a war could make a, an, an argument that national security and military readiness is a very important interest of the state and letting women be in the draft might actually jeopardize that important interest could also be that there's an important interest in making sure that um that one family member is at home and women are more you know appropriate to be home to take care of the kids all that 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 seems like that would be a violation of the equal protection clause uh, but that hasn't been challenged and uh, we remain to be seen whether or not that would be found to be unconstitutional uh, uh, uh using the intermediate scrutiny test but the Supreme Court has never heard that case. The highest level of scrutiny that courts give to um, differential treatment is known as the strict scrutiny test. And so some types of different treatment are assumed to be unjustified or unconstitutional, okay? Um, and so if you're uh, treating people of uh, ages differently or those who have licenses and don't have licenses or even gender and sexual sexual orientation the court does not assume that those laws are are unconstitutional okay however if laws are treating people of different races differently different ethnicities differently different religions differently or national origin the country that you come from if that's the basis of the different treatment that the court assumes using the strict scrutiny test that these laws are unconstitutional until you've proven otherwise, okay? Um, these race, ethnicity, religion, national or, or origin are considered suspect classifications and they're considered suspect classifications because the different bit, uh, treatment is based on an immutable characteristic that has no reasonable relationship to being human, right? So your religion, your ethnicity, race, your national origin, it has it's 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 something that's immutable, the country you're born in, the you know, the the religion that you choose, your ethnicity or race, you don't choose it for the most part. Uh, and also it has nothing to do with um, your ability to um, uh, function as a human being. So laws that treat suspect classes differently re receive strict scrutiny from, from the court. That's the test that's used. And, and when the court uses this test, the burden of proof is on the government, it's on the state, and they must show that that different treatment is related to not a rational reason or an important reason, but a compelling reason, right? It has to be related to a compelling state interest, a, 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 something that the government must do that's of paramount importance. And also that, that, that this is basically the only way that they can achieve this very important, this uh, goal that is of paramount importance. Most laws that differentiate on the basis of race, national origin, religion, ethnicity, are unconstitutional, okay? So this, it's strict in theory, but fatal in fact, right? That most laws that differentiate on the basis of those things are, are considered unconstitutional, um, but not all. And probably the biggest example of uh, a different treatment uh, on the basis of race is affirmative action, okay? Uh, and so uh, affirmative action are, you'll read about it more in your textbook, but there are programs or policies designed to remedy past injustices, right? And so, you know, today we still have affirmative action uh, when it comes to um, college admissions, right? That race can be one category of many categories that's taken into consideration when admitting somebody to a school. And so basically it's saying that, that you know, 
people uh, uh, who are racial minorities, um, that you can take that into consideration when um, considering whether they should uh, get get admitted into school. And that might seem like, hey, is that you know, is is that that different treatment between white applicants and black applicants or other minority candidates? Um, is that related to a compelling state interest? Up to this point, that um, that uh, uh, the Supreme Court has said that 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 is a compelling interest that there's a compelling interest in repairing harms and injustices from the past and also creating a diverse um, environment in a college um, admissions class, right? So that you have that diversity of viewpoints and backgrounds is an important compelling interest for the state. So at this point, affirmative action, it is a law that does um, uh, engage in different treatment based on race. But at this point, the Supreme Court has said that that is, does not violate the Equal Protection Clause because it's it's related to the compelling state interest of repairing previous harm and creating a diverse viewpoint within a college classroom. Um, the affirmative action is probably on the chopping block, though, in this um, in this term of the Supreme Court. So keep your eyes open for the cases that the court will be hearing in this term. The answer to the is different treatment based on race, sex, religion, ability, it, permissible. It's a really important question because the way the court answers that question defines civil rights policy and law, okay? If the court says that different treatment is unconstitutional, that changes and nullifies laws saying that different treatment is unconstitutional. But if they say that the different treatment is constitutional, that defines the civil rights policy and law as well. So as the answer to that question, is it a constitutional? As that changes, so too does policy and law. But keep in mind that that change doesn't happen in a vacuum. It doesn't magically happen. It happens as a result of political struggle and direct action that people engage in to challenge laws that treat people in a discriminatory way and bring those laws to the court so that the court can determine whether or not these laws are constitutional. And that's what we're going to be looking at in the next lecture.